This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. In this part of the test, you will hear nurse Naomi Holm interviewing David McKenzie, who is caring for his wife Jill, who has a terminal condition. Complete the notes with the word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Oh, good morning, David. How was your weekend? Oh, morning, nurse. It's a little bit tough, actually, this last weekend. Yes, I'm sure it has been. I just wondered, could you tell me a little bit more about how it went? Well, it started on Saturday night. Um, Jill had quite a restless night. It was breakthrough pain at time, and I was giving the medication, but I didn't feel it was as effective as it had been in the past. So you have been giving the same medication regularly, but you're not getting the effect that we were last week, for example. No, that's right. And, you know, I could see by her expression that she was quite uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. And again, this the same thing happened last night as well. Mm -hmm. a similar so you've had two bad nights. And is she able to eat anything? I have been trying, you know, to give us, you know, different things like food, but she really has a, only a small appetite and mainly just fluids. Is she having much fluid? A few sips, a um, few glasses of water. Um, we have tried some green teas and various things, but mm -hmm. that's about it. Mm -hmm. And is she still able to walk around a little bit? Uh, she did walk out, you know, yesterday and she went out into the lounge room and, you know, we got her to watch, sit down and watch a little bit of TV, but she tires very quickly. quickly. Mm -hmm. and, and what about her general mood? She's not saying too much, you know, and the kids are around too, but she, you know, I, I get the feeling that she is getting a bit depressed. Mm -hmm. And have you had any visitors at all to sort of break the monotony and... Not this weekend. I mean, we have been pretty lucky with, with visitors and people coming, but this weekend we didn't. Right. Now, I know you've got the two boys, uh, David. What age are they again? The older boy, Michael, he's 13, and his brother, Tommy, is 11. I see. And how are they coping? Uh, what about school? Are they managing there? To be honest, I haven't been paying too much attention. You know, they say they're doing the schoolwork, but look, they're, they're missing their mother because she, you know, she was always the one who spent time with them after school. And she, you know, now um, she can't really do that. And so they're sort of playing up a little bit. Yeah. Is the school aware of the problem? The teachers realise that the pressure that the boys Oh, are yes. Under? Yeah, the school's been great. There's, there's no problem there. Oh, that's good. And is there any family help that you can get? Well, I have had some help from my sister, and she's been great. But, you know, she's got her own job and family to look after. So it is getting a little bit tough, and I don't really want, and certainly Jill doesn't want her, to be a burden on other people. Yes, I can understand that, although I think people sometimes feel a great satisfaction in being able to help. Mm. But how about you, David? Are you still doing some work? Uh, I was up until about two weeks ago, but I'm taking a bit of a break. Uh, it is a little bit tough financially, but um, it's, I just want to be with Jill and make sure she's as comfortable as possible. And are you getting any break from that at all, sometimes just to get away by yourself for a little while? Um, not actually recently. No, well, I'm looking at you and you're looking very tired. Yeah, I guess I'm a bit tired. But... 
look, I promised Jill that, you know, we get through this. And so that's what I'm trying to do. Right. David, have you given any thought to palliative care? No, not a great deal. I mean, look, I promised Jill that she'd be able to stay at home, you know, until the end. You know, she likes this home. She's comfortable here. So, you know, I'm just trying to, to do that for her. Well, I think you've done a very good job. But sometimes it does come to a point, particularly with the breakthrough pain uh, that Jill is experiencing, where there might be a better option with palliative care to see that she really gets as much quality of life as she can for the time left to her. Yes, but I just have this image of hospitals, you know, as busy places and she won't get that personal attention that, that we've been giving her here. Yes, I can see your concerns there. The thing to think about with palliative care is that the people who go into this field, the nurses who choose to work in a palliative care hospital, they do so because they're so strongly committed to care for people. I mean, some people would find it a very difficult environment to work in, but the nurses there get their satisfaction from knowing that they've done everything possible to make a person's end of life as pain-free and comfortable as it can be. Right, I see. Okay. That doesn't sound too bad. And you see, it allows the uh, pain medication to be monitored very regularly. There's no delays. As soon as it's seen that uh, there is breakthrough pain, the doctors can be called in and look at how they can really relieve that. Do they have individual rooms and these sorts of things? In many of the um, palliative care hospitals, they do have individual rooms. Uh, another thing too is I believe you told me once that you had full health cover, your health insurance. Yes, yes, we do. So in that case, that would help also to alleviate any extra expense. Right. Well, I wouldn't want to be, if we did choose this, I wouldn't want to be restricted in any way. I mean, visiting hours and those sorts of things. They're very liberal. You see, these hospitals really work on patient time, not hospital time. And if a patient is sleeping in in the morning, well, they don't wake them. They let mm. them wake up at their normal time. And so long as the visitors are not disturbing the patients, they're very welcome to spend almost all day with them. And in fact, if you're ever really worried, they'll set up a bed in the room and uh, visitors can stay the night if they're close family members. And in your opinion, you know, you've seen Jill, you know the stage she's at. Do you think this is the right time to do that? Or do you think we can, you know, I should just keep trying, you know, and doing my best to care for her here? Well, I think it would be a good idea, if you feel you can, to talk this over with Jill. But my feeling at the moment is that she is reaching the stage where she needs almost more care than you can give her, particularly in terms of the pain management. And the other side of it is that if, G if Jill were in the palliative care hospital, you could devote your time to giving her comfort and talking with her without having the responsibility of worrying about medications or uh, running the house, all the things that are taking up so much of your time. Yes, okay. All right, well, I think I'd like to talk that over a bit with Jill first. Well, I think that's a, that's a very good idea. Just one other thing I'd like to mention that you might like to consider. There is the opportunity to have spiritual support because local ministers from a number of churches visit regularly. And there are also counselling services. And for the boys, there is a special care counselling service. Um, it's designed to help the children of people or parents with a terminal illness. Okay, well actually, you know, that they might benefit from that because they, you know, I have tried to talk to them about it, but it is hard for me to do that, so. Well, sometimes they need to talk to somebody away from the close family environment. And certainly, if you would like, I can uh, contact several palliative care places and I can bring you some more information about them when I come tomorrow. 
Okay, now that would be really good. And if you could bring that information, in the meantime, I'll talk to Jill and, and we'll see if we can come up with a decision. Well, that's good. Well, I'll help you any way I can, David. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. In this part of the test, you will hear Dr. Jane Hope interviewing Henry Bunyan, a patient with a recent problem. Come on in, Henry. How are you this morning? Not too bad, thanks, Doctor, and yourself? Oh, well, busy as usual. Yeah, I can see that. There are a lot of customers in the waiting room. Yeah. There was a nice spot of rain we got last night. Yes, it certainly saved water in the garden, and that was a bonus. So, Henry, have you come for your blood test results? Yeah, that's right. Give us the news, Doctor. Well, it's not bad news, but your total cholesterol was 6.6, .6, your triglycerides 1.6, and your HDL was 1.54, and the LDL was 4.65. So what does that all mean, Doctor? Well, you remember we did the same test a year ago? Yeah. So what these current results show now is that, compared with last year's results, there has been a sharp rise in your LDL level. Yes, well, what's brought this about? Well, as we discussed last year, cholesterol is carried in the blood by different types of protein carriers called lipoproteins. Yeah, I remember that. Well, the two which carry the most cholesterol are the low-density lipoproteins, LDLs, which we believe promote atherosclerosis, or thickening of the arteries, while high-density lipoproteins, HDLs, tend to prevent this. In your case, unfortunately, your LDL has increased and there are a number of factors that may have contributed to the rise in your LDL. For instance, a higher fat content in your diet, right. increase in stress, mm -hmm. maybe you're not exercising as much as you were. I guess I'm not. Mm, that's right. Have you noticed any discomfort or had any general health issues that have caused you concern lately? No, not really. Okay, now Henry, um, I know your family history and that your dad died of a stroke at 60. I just want to ask you a few questions about what you're doing now. Sure. What about your current diet? Are you eating much fatty food? Yeah, I guess so. I, mean, I, I do enjoy McDonald's at lunchtime and um, eat quite a bit of meat. I'm not really a big fan of vegetables. Mm, yeah. Have you noticed any change in weight? Um, do you think you've gained a little? Well, since I last saw you, I've probably put on about five kilograms. Mm, yeah, well, that's quite substantial. Um, what about exercise? Do you still manage to do that regularly? I remember last time you told me that you were taking your dog for a run once or twice a week and, and that you swim regularly. Well, actually, in the last year I've been pretty busy at work and I've had a lot of family commitments lately, so I'll probably exercise a bit less. Mm. And are you still smoking? Yes, I am. I'm, I've tried to cut down, though. I'm probably smoking five or ten cigarettes a day. Mm, okay. And how about alcohol? How many alcoholic drinks do you have in a week? Well, in a week... I, I, well, I probably have two or three a day, so I don't know if you multiply that. You know, I, I guess it adds up to quite a few, 16 or more maybe. Mm -hmm. And uh, would you say that you drink more at the weekend? Yeah, yeah, a little bit more on the weekend. We have a glass of wine as well at night sometimes. Mm -hmm. Right, okay.
ED nurse talking to the relative of a patient who has been recently admitted. Did you want to talk to me, Mr. Tanaka? Oh, yes, you see, I just wanted to let you know that my father, well, as you know, he's recently been diagnosed with dementia. Most of the time it's not an issue and his spats never last long. It's just that I wanted to prepare you. Sometimes he's really not himself. Ah, uh, okay, Mr. Tanaka, I think I understand. Can your father become aggressive? Yes. I mean, I think it's just that he gets frustrated sometimes. He can't remember things, and I think it's scary for him. Uh -huh. He was never, ever like this before his dementia, and those periods, well, they really don't reflect his true character. Of course. Thanks for letting me know. You hear an obstetrician describe a caesarean section to a pregnant patient. Labour can progress differently for different people. In some circumstances, if labour is longer than expected, and if we detect that the baby is distressed, then we may have to consider an emergency caesarean section. It's a procedure that we perform in theatre, and it is carried out under spinal or epidural anaesthetic, so that you don't feel anything, but you will be awake. A screen is placed across your body, so you don't have to see what's being done. We make an incision in your tummy and womb, just under your bikini line to remove your baby and then stitch up the wound. It takes around 40 minutes and your birth partner can be there at all times. Does that make sense? You hear a GP and his practice nurse discussing their yearly schedule. In September we'll have a lot of new patients as the first year university students will all register during freshers. Uh, yes, uh, we were really run off our feet last year, weren't we? Yep, it was a madhouse. Do you think we should hire agency staff to help out for the first couple of weeks this time around? Well, I think part of the problem was that last year Dr Igwe and Nurse Fletcher were both away. Uh, Dr Igwe went to Costa Rica and Nurse Fletcher had the flu. Oh, right, I remember. Well, we can't do much to prevent staff illness. No, but we can ask people to avoid booking time off in those first three weeks. OK, I'll send an email out today. You hear a nurse prepare a patient for a flu shot. Good morning, Mr. Henderson. Hi. Uh, Dr. Ray has recommended that you get a flu immunization shot before you're discharged. I've got the injection ready to give you. Are you allergic to anything? Uh, I'm only allergic to latex and penicillin. Um, I, I don't know if I want the flu shot. Oh. The last time I got the shot, I got sick. I'm sorry that happened to you. What kind of symptoms did you have after that last flu shot? Uh, I got a runny nose and a headache and my arm felt like someone punched me. Uh, sometimes the flu shot can cause reactions like a sore injection site and headache. Uh, other common symptoms include being tired, uh, muscle and joint aches, shivering and fever. All of these symptoms can be seen with the flu, but the shot can't give you the flu. You hear a doctor talk to a patient about her injury. Good morning, Mrs. Bowder. I'll be your doctor taking care of your cut there. But what exactly happened? Oh, it's embarrassing, really. You see, 
I was just trying to chop some tomatoes for dinner and the knife accidentally slipped. Oh, I'm so clumsy. I hope it doesn't hurt too much to stitch back up. Well, we're going to numb the area now with a shot of lidocaine. You'll feel a poke of the needle and a slight burn, but afterwards the area should be numb and you'll feel nothing during the procedure. Oh, good. We should be finished in about ten minutes. Good. How many stitches will I need? And how long will I have to stay in? I'm really conscious about my hands, so I hope I don't have a scar. I will only know for sure once I finish suturing, but by my estimation, you might require at least four to five sutures. Oh. They'll have to stay in for five to ten days, and you'll need to come back in to get them removed. Right. I'll do my best to try and line up the edges to create as little scarring as possible. Yeah. But I can't guarantee there will be nothing there. You hear a trainee nurse asking a senior colleague about the treatment for a patient with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. I haven't treated anyone with COPD before. What would we need to do differently? One of the most important things would be to make sure to prescribe oxygen at levels between 88 to 92 percent. Okay, so why would that be necessary? If he's having trouble breathing, shouldn't we prescribe higher oxygen levels? Most patients receive oxygen at levels between 94 and 98 percent. Well, in healthy individuals, a rise in carbon dioxide would result in an increased drive to breathe in order to eliminate the excess gas. Right. However, in some patients with COPD, this response is blunted, and their main mechanism for respiratory drive is controlled by the level of oxygen in the body instead. If the level of oxygen given to a COPD patient is increased too much, it can actually reduce the stimulus to breathe and cause hypoventilation, resulting in an increase in CO2. You hear an interview with a physician called Dr. Tadita Hussain, who's talking about treating patients with cystic fibrosis. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 1 to 6.
Cystic fibrosis is a condition that causes mucus to be thicker and stickier than it should be. Dr. Tadida Hussain specializes in cystic fibrosis treatment and is here to share her thoughts on caring for people with the condition. Tadida, can you tell us a bit more about patients who suffer from cystic fibrosis? Absolutely. Sufferers tend to carry two to five times as much salt in their bodies as those without the condition, mm -hmm. so you can see why their mucus is thicker than average. Treatment for these patients is usually quite time-consuming and repetitive. Patients are often required to stay in hospital for long stretches. And as the symptoms of the condition begin to present very early on in the patient's life, many of my patients are young people. And so we tend to see lots of patients with cystic fibrosis finding these hospital visits frustrating. Right. In fact, throughout the UK, about 80% of patients with cystic fibrosis who are hospitalised report feeling at least minimal levels of depression. How about young patients who aren't currently hospitalised? What can be challenging about their treatment? Well, patients can be required to take around 30 pills a day to keep cystic fibrosis under control. So it's understandable that teenagers and young people who just want to be free and independent might resent this ordeal if they think they can get away with it. One of the most difficult things we have to contend with is the fact that if patients stop taking their medication or doing their daily breathing treatments, their condition won't immediately worsen. Instead, it will gradually become more severe until they contract a serious infection which puts their lives at risk. So what approaches do you use when treating patients with cystic fibrosis? Well, we've found distraction therapy to be extremely useful. We're incredibly lucky to have received a donation of a number of virtual reality headsets following their success in a number of treatment trials. We use the virtual reality headsets to transport the patient to outdoor settings, often corresponding to the activities they're required to do with us. When they complete breathing exercises on a stationary bike, for example, the VR headsets display a virtual outdoor bike ride. Our patients find it helpful to pretend to be somewhere else during treatment, and it's often easier for us to administer breathing treatments to patients using these headsets, as they're more relaxed when they're not focused on the actuality of the test. So, what sorts of changes have you seen in your patients as a result of these methods? One of my patients, a 24-year-old man with cystic fibrosis who was in hospital waiting for a lung transplant, well, he found treatment very difficult at first. He was preoccupied by his need for a transplant and frustrated by feelings of powerlessness. He would often resist treatment. We started using the virtual reality systems with him as soon as we got them, and it took a while for him to get on board, but when he did, it was like someone had breathed new life into him. Not only did he stop hindering his treatment, he actually began to look forward to it. He's even started helping us to think about other ways we can improve the experiences of our patients, like improving social interaction. Uh, yes, I understand that there are difficulties involved in patient communication. Mm. We're looking into the possibility of instant messaging functions between patients and even virtual games that they can play against each other. Unfortunately, patients with cystic fibrosis have to be kept apart to avoid cross-infection. It's just one more cross to bear for our patients that they can't talk to those going through the same thing. Right. Our patients get plenty of interaction with myself and the rest of the staff, but we'd like to make sure they have access to a network of fellow sufferers too, for support and advice. I see. That all sounds quite futuristic. Are there any other advances on the horizon for the treatment of cystic fibrosis? Well, there's a new drug that's been in the news recently. It's a combination of Lamacafta and Ivacafta. You might know it by the brand name or Kambi. The drug works by improving the level of water and salt in the body, thereby reducing the thick mucus that causes illness and respiratory issues in those with cystic fibrosis. Even more exciting and futuristic, though, is the possibility of gene therapy where the genetic mutation that causes cystic fibrosis in individuals is replaced with a healthy gene. This would effectively cure those with the condition and significantly extend the lives of thousands of people and remove the need for lengthy stays in hospital.
Now turn over and look at extract 2, questions 7 to 12. You hear a physician called Dr. Hubert Johnson discuss improving efficiency at a healthcare practice. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Hubert Johnson and I've been asked to speak to you about my experiences in the healthcare industry concerning something that affects all health professionals, improving efficiency. It seems to be a given these days that practices will struggle with a lack of efficiency. Uh, we've actually found that this expectation in and of itself can reduce efficiency and increase delays even further. In a recent survey, when patients were asked why they arrived late to their appointments, 30% said that they had assumed that the previous appointment would run long. Patients expect to be kept waiting, and to some extent, we expect that patients will be kept waiting. And so the first thing we need to address is our attitudes and the attitudes of our patients. So let me start by telling you about the efficiency I observed in a practice I visited a couple of weeks ago. At this practice, patients could not make appointments online, but they could either phone up or make an appointment in person. There were never more than two receptionists working in the morning, and the practice generally scheduled 80 appointments each day. Patients who were not attending a follow-up appointment were required to make their appointment on the day off. Can you imagine what that practice was like in the first couple of hours they were open? The receptionists were inundated by calls and walk-ins trying to schedule appointments. As you can imagine, patients who had seen what the practice was like in the morning expected that if they didn't have the first slot of the day, they'd be delayed by at least 10 minutes. So naturally, they arrived to their appointment 10 minutes late. But one of the most important things you really must address in your practice in order to improve efficiency is the way you present your practice to patients. If they believe that you are always running late, guess what? They'll be running late too. Now, let's think for a moment about what needs to be done on the patient's end before an appointment can take place. You might be thinking that there are only two steps to the process. One, the patient books an appointment, and two, the patient arrives at the practice in time for their appointment. Well, we healthcare professionals often forget that there's actually a step that comes before this. 
Firstly, the patient must decide that their issue is significant enough to warrant an appointment. So, about a decade ago, my practice was really struggling from a lack of efficiency. I was working extremely long hours to try to accommodate everyone, and I was becoming increasingly frustrated with conducting appointments that didn't seem strictly necessary. I got to thinking about how I might be able to help patients to reconsider their initial assumption when booking appointments and to treat minor issues at home. At the same time, I did not want my patients to feel unsupported. I decided that I would begin to give weekly presentations in the evenings about self-care. As I tended to see a multitude of patients coming in for similar issues that they could actually treat themselves, each week I focused on a different common theme. The presentations lasted for just one hour, but I found that they resulted in seven fewer unnecessary appointments each week. These days, of course, I no longer have to give a physical presentation. Uh, thanks to modern technology, I simply upload instructional videos to our practice's website. We also email these videos out to patients periodically. We can and should make use of technology as a tool in our practices to help us improve efficiency. However, it's important to note that while many, perhaps even the majority of your patients will be capable of using technology to arrange their appointments, there are many people uncomfortable or unable to use technology, so you must always make sure that these patients are accommodated too. Providing your patients with more options rather than replacing old options is often the best practice for improving efficiency. Now, let's move on to look at a practice that used technology in a surprising way.